here again for another portion of worship. If you would, take out your Bible with me and turn to the book of Mark, the sixth chapter. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through verses 29. Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. Uh, the Bible teaches that all of us have different temptations, um, weaknesses, things that we struggle with independently, but what I think most people, myself included, uh, struggle with from one degree or another is, uh, to, is, is, is the elevation, the elevated desire to please people, to be a people pleaser. I think that's something that many of us struggle with because it's natural for us. Um, I've heard many people say, you know, I don't really care what people think about me. Uh, that might sound kind of tough, but many people who say that inside really crave for others to like them and, and accept them. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard for us to say no sometimes because we're afraid of disappointing others or, or afraid of what they might think. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say about people pleasing. In John chapter 12, verse 43, Jesus speaks to the Pharisees and he says, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from, the, from God. The Pharisees, Jesus says, love to be praised and to be seen outwardly by others. They love human approval, human approval more than they love the approval of God. They cared more about what people thought uh, more than what God thought about them. And that's really the root, I think, of people pleasing. It's a desire and love for self glory. We want to be seen as valuable, we want to be seen as worthy. We want to be seen as beautiful as we really are in the eyes of others, to, to be revered and awed upon by, uh, by all to see as someone great, as someone special, as someone spectacular. Now, I'm not saying, and there's certainly nothing wrong with giving praise to someone or receiving praise and encouragement in a humble manner. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But, but, when, we be, but, but when we become so mesmerized by the approval of others more than we do of God, and, and when we fear the disapproval of people more than the disapproval of God, it's then that we fall into a very deadly trap. When we give in to this kind of people-pleasing, we're elevating ourselves uh, inevitably to the position of God who alone deserves glory, who alone deserves honor, who alone deserves praise and should be the center of our worship, not ourselves. So tonight, I want us to dive into a story about a people pleaser. It's really a tragic story. Um, it's about a man who had an opportunity to do the right thing, to do what would lead to blessing for him and for everybody else around him, and to God's ultimate glorification. He had all the opportunity in the world to do that which was right, but failed to do so miser miserably because he loved human praise. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We see within Mark chapter 6, verse 14 through 29, the story of King Herod and John the Baptist. Now, this story... It's, uh, I've, I think I've said before, Mark likes sandwiches. <laughs> he likes to put a transitionary story embedded between two other stories. And this is an instance of that in Mark chapter 14, uh, Mark chapter 6, verses 14, extending through verse uh, 29. We see this kind of sandwich, this transition story. Uh, previously, prior to this story, and we talked about this last time, Jesus sends out the 12 uh, disciples to to heal, to cast out demons, to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, and then we get to this block of text that we're going to talk about tonight that really um, has uh, seem, seems to have nothing to do with that story. And then uh, after the story in, uh, that we're going to talk about tonight, uh, the Mark picks back up 
with Jesus feeding the 5,000 and the, the disciples coming back. So this story serves as kind of an intermission uh, between what we talked about last time. And it's not just an intermission, it's, it's a flashback uh, that tells about the execution of John the Baptist at the hand of King Herod. And it's really a dramatic story. Uh, it's kind of like a soap opera, uh, if you've ever wa watched one of those. It has all kind of uh, enticing elements. It, it has intrigue. It has sexual deviance and promiscuity. It has jealousy. It has revenge. It has brutality. All the things that would make for a popular TV show um, that, that, you, that you see um, every day. So let's pick up with the text. Let's look at verse 14 in Mark chapter 6. Let's read verses 14 through 16. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That, that's why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, no, it's, it's Elijah. And others said, he's a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Now, you might remember another King Herod uh, that we see within the Gospels, Herod the Great. Um, Herod the Great was king when Jesus was born. Um, in, if you read the account in Matthew and Luke, you see a, de a description of him. Um, he, he was the one, remember, who ordered all of the baby boys that were born um, around the region of Bethlehem to be, uh, that were two years and younger, to be executed, um, to be killed savage, savagely. Um, that was Herod the Great. Um, uh, he, he was a very brutal person, very wicked person, as you can obviously see from that text. Now, this king that we're talking about tonight, this Herod, that's not that Herod. Uh, it, this is that Herod's son that we're talking about tonight. This is Herod Antipas, uh, King uh, Herod the Great's son. Now, Herod Antipas, he reigned over the, the region surrounding the Sea of Galilee. Um, in the text here, it says that he heard about Jesus' fame. Uh, and following in line with the previous story, he had heard about the um, miracles of Jesus, the miraculous ability for him to cast out demons, uh, and, and his, his extraordinary preaching ability. Um, he's, he heard about the limited commission of him, of Jesus sending out his 12 apostles slash disciples into, into the surrounding towns to preach the gospel of, of the kingdom. So, so Herod is hearing about um, all, all of this, uh, and it scares him. He's afraid. He's terrified when, when he hears this news that Jesus, his fame is growing and his fame is spreading. It scares him because, it scares him because a year before, a year, a year before Jesus sent out the twelve, Herod had John the Baptist killed. And when Jesus comes on the scene, he believes that it's John the Baptist in resurrected form. Herod believes that uh, this is John that I killed. This, this, this Jesus and his fame is spreading. So it scares him. He's, he's afraid. Some people were saying about this Jesus that it's Elijah. Some people that were saying that it was some Old Testament prophet. Uh, but Herod Antipas declares, no, it's, it's John whom I executed. He's come back from the dead, and, and it implies that he's coming back for revenge, um, and that's why, that's why he scares. And, and then, in the next verse, the text takes you back a year earlier, around a year. Uh, let's look in verse 17 of Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, verse 17. Here's the story. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So beginning here, Mark takes us back and tells us how the execution of John the Baptist unfolded. 
uh, the drama begins, the soap opera begins here within this uh, passage. Re remember that John the Baptist, we've talked about him within this series, he's the forerunner who prepared the way for Jesus, the one whom Isaiah the prophet prophesied about to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. And John, he had a singular message that he proclaimed uh, during his ministry. And his singular message was moral transformation. Repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The time has come. It is here. The time has come for moral transformation. It's time to live a morally excellent life. It's time to put away your sin. It's time to put away your depravity and to bring your life and your will in conformity with the will of God because the kingdom of heaven is at hand and it's coming into the world. And this message of moral transformation, it stuck at the very heart of a very immoral lifestyle that Herod Antipas was leading as we see within the text. Uh, and, and at some point, as, as we just read, John was able to confront Herod and focus upon one particular element of his sinful life, referring to moral transformation. And that, is, that was his marriage, the marriage of Herod. Herod, as the text says, was married to a woman named Herodias who was uh, kind of gross, was his niece and his sister-in-law at the same time. It was his half-brother Philip's wife. Uh, somehow Herod, Herod Antipas was able to lure his sister-in-law and, uh, and niece uh, away from his brother and marry her to, to satisfy his own greed, to satisfy his own lust, which was a direct violation of Jewish law. I mean, this is uh, moral depravity in, uh, in action uh, in, in here. Um, and John preaches against it. Now, some may ask, you know, was, was Herod really a Jew? Was he, was he really, did he really live under the law of Moses? And, and did, he, did he have these kind of moral restraints? Well, well Herod was, he, he was part Jew. He acknowledged his Jewishness publicly, Herod Antipas did. He ruled among the Jews. He respected to a degree the Jewish laws. Uh, he kept the feasts and the festivals um, with, uh, within Judaism. But Herod, to understand Herod's religiosity, Herod was kind of like... Um, some of the high-level politicians that we see within our day. You know, we, we, see, uh, we see, quite honestly, politicians that, that might claim to be Christians outwardly um, and have, they, they have some respect for the Bible. They might go to some kind of house of worship uh, every, every so often, every, um, uh, every like Christmas or Easter or, or something like that. But if you look at their life, they really aren't that interested in becoming like Jesus. Um, they don't put their money where their mouth is, um, in essence. Their, their Christianity is more of just an outward show just for the public so that they kind of put on a, a Christian face um, for votes, I guess. But Herod, as we look at him in this text, Herod is kind of like that with his Jewishness. He openly embraces Judaism, but it's not that big of a deal uh, to, to him. And John confronts Herod about this particular sin in his life. He boldly declares that it is not lawful for you to have this woman. You are not living in conformity with the will of God that you claim to be following. And John was hated for that. Look in the next passage in verse 19 of chapter 6, verse 19. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she couldn't. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. And notice this, this is interesting. When he heard him, when Herod heard John, when he heard him preach, when he, when he heard him, 
he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. Other translations said he listened to him. He enjoyed hearing him and his message. Now we see within this passage that Herodias hated John because of his message of moral transformation. Repent. Live a moral lifestyle. You are not living in conformity with the will of God. And because of that, she holds this grudge against John. And she wanted him dead. She wanted him to be killed. But she couldn't. She couldn't do anything about it. Because there existed this weird kind of relationship between Herod, between Herod Antipas and John the Baptist. And you see that within the text. Herod, in some weird way, actually kind of liked John. He, he liked hearing him. Even though his life didn't uh, align with his message whatsoever, even though he lived in direct opposition to everything that John stood for and everything that he taught, Herod kind of liked the guy for, for, for some reason. Um, you know, I look, I look th throughout the Christian landscape in the world, uh, and quite honestly, there, there are many people who wear the name Christian uh, and, and like, to, like to hear good Christian speakers. They might even come to church. They might even come to church regularly and like to have their ears tickled and hear the message, but their lives are in direct opposition to everything that they hear. And I believe that Herod and John's relationship probably was something like that uh, to, in trying to understand this. So Herod, he keeps John safe. He keeps him safe. He keeps him safe from harm. He keeps him safe from his wife. He keeps him safe in prison until Herodias has this opportunity to carry out the evil desire that is within her heart. Notice the next passage in verse 21 of chapter 6. Verse 21. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. Now, like we've talked about already, although Herod claims Jewishness outwardly. That's his identity. His life, it more so reflects Roman culture. Uh, Herod identified as a Jew, but his lifestyle, really it was pure Roman. Uh, and, and in Roman culture, if you look at the way that high-ranking officials um, would conduct themselves during parties and festivals and birthday parties, as, was, as is mentioned here in, in the text, they're filled with all kinds of filth. They're filled with drinking. They're filled with lewdness. They're filled with all kinds of exotic behavior that would be uh, unpleasant for me to even talk about from the pulpit. So, in Roman culture, at a Roman birthday party for a high-ranking official, it was pretty much anything goes. Anything. Have it your way at your birthday party. Whatever you want, whatever pleasure you have, may it be fulfilled. That was what a Roman birthday party would look like, and that's what this party was like as well. So Herod and all of his cronies, all of his buddies... All of his military commanders, all of the high-ranking officials, they have this party together, and they're getting drunk. They're becoming more and more intoxicated, and things, they start to escalate more and more and more as they become more intoxicated and as they lose their senses. They desire more pleasure, and to put it, to put it in modern language, the way that it escalates, how far it goes... It's time to bring out an exotic dancer at this birthday party. Look with me in verse 22 of chapter 6. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, for, for what should I ask? And she said, 
the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Now, the way the text reads, it, it seems as if Herodias had this whole thing planned out. It's like she already has this in her mind, how this is going to go. She saw this prime opportunity to carry out her revenge on uh, John the Baptist by, and this is the way she does it, this is sick, by allowing her own daughter to become this object for her husband's own pleasure, through which, by which, she would trick her husband so that John would be executed. And she took it. She took advantage of that opportunity because she hated him so much. She was filled with so much hatred for John that she carried through with this very wicked, evil plan. She hated, she hated the fact that John told her that she was wrong, that she was not living according to God's will. How many times do we see that? today. Notice with me the last part of the, the text in verse 26. Mark chapter 6, verse 26, and we're about to make some application here. Verse 26 through 29 says, and the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. As we see this story, the story of Herod Antipas and his conflicted heart, Herod Antipas is quite possibly one of the most saddest, the, the saddest figure in all of human history. Herod Antipas, he had every opportunity at his fingertips to do what was right. He had a holy man, a man that possessed the word of God, a preacher of the good news. He had this man in his possession influencing him and preaching to him. He could have listened to him. He, he could have repented and become a servant of God and proclaimed the gospel in all of the world so that he and so many other people could be blessed. He had an opportunity right at his fingertips. But because he loved human praise and human approval, and because he feared human disapproval, most of all, he failed to do what was right. And that probably led to his ultimate destruction. He feared his dinner guests. What are they going to say? What are they going to think if I go back on my word? They're not going to respect me. I might lose my position. I might lose my credibility. I might lose what I have if I do the right thing. I love to be praised. I love the glory that comes from people more than I love the will of God and what the right thing is to do. He feared his dinner guests and he, and he loved their approval. So he had John killed. Herod feared everyone but the Lord. But John the Baptist feared no one but the Lord. And we might look at Herod and say, what a coward. No, you had an opportunity to do what was right. You knew, you, you, you knew, your conscience was telling you uh, to go in the right direction, but you didn't listen to it. We might look at him and say, what a coward. But ironically, so many people, and sometimes some of us, are just like him. People pleasers. Those who love glorification. Those who love to be praised. Those who love human approval and fear human disapproval more than they fear the disapproval 
of God. And I want to ask you tonight, this is the crux of the message, which category do you fit in? Are you like John the Baptist who fears no one but the Lord and is going to proclaim the truth and be a lover of truth and not be afraid of what man can do to them or the, or the praise of man or the, the, or the approval of man? Or are you like Herod who loves human approval and who fears most of all human disapproval? Brothers and sisters, I think this is something I... I think this is fair to say. I think this is something we all struggle with, from one degree, from one degree or another. People pleasing, um, pursuing self glory over God's glory, being afraid of man more than we're afraid of of God. But we need to remember, and we need to focus upon why we are here, why we are on this earth. But we, we, we as God's people, we are here to live for His glory, for God's ultimate glory, for God's glorification, not our own. And that's that's the way things work best. Our hearts and our sinful flesh may not be telling us that in the moment, but that's the way things work best. When God is glorified, when God is glorified, that is when we experience the kind of joy that we're intended to to experience. God gets the glory and we get the joy from living in His presence. That's the way things work best. And that needs to be on the forefront of our minds. I live for the glory of God. I don't live for human approval. I don't live for human praise. I fear God more than I fear the disapproval of man. So that's tonight's lesson. That's what I'm going to leave you with. If you fear people more than God, you're cut from the same cloth as King Herod. But if you fear God more than people, you're becoming like Jesus Christ. Tonight, if anyone has any need, if anyone has any prayer requests, uh, we urge you to come forward tonight. Uh, Also, if you're not a Christian, we uh, extend the, the gospel invitation to you. Jesus is Lord. He's come to this earth. He's died for our sins. He's risen on the third day. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on behalf of the saints. And that good news of Him being your Lord is extended to you. If you don't have Him tonight, believe in Him. Come to Him. Believe in this Jesus. Live a morally transformed life. Repent of your sins. Walk in His ways. You can come forward tonight and confess your faith in Him. And you can be immersed in the waters of baptism and begin a relationship with Him. Tonight, if you have any need, why don't you come forward as we stand and as we sing.